All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another live virtual public program with the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. My name is Cale Wilcox. I am the public engagement manager at the Museum of Flight, and it's so good to see you all here again with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited about tonight's uh, uh, guest and presentation that you're going to hear momentarily here. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us uh, as we continue with these uh, virtual programs as we uh, navigate what is hopefully the final stages of this global pandemic. And we do hope to see you all down at the Museum of Flight in person uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, but tonight, our uh, very special guest is Dr. Tanya Harrison, uh, the Director of Science Strategy for the Federal Arm of the Earth Observing Satellite and Sustainability Company, Planet. Uh, tonight, she will be discussing Earth Observing Satellites, how the data they collect benefits human life here on the ground, and how missions to other planets help us to better understand our own. Dr. Tanya Harrison is a professional Martian, having worked in science and mission operations for multiple NASA Mars missions over the past 13 years. She's worked on the Perseverance, Curiosity, and Opportunity rovers, as well as NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Tanya holds a PhD in geology with a specialization in planetary science and exploration from the University of Western Ontario and a Bachelor of Science in Astronomy and Physics from the University of Washington. You can find her tweeting about all things Mars as at Tanya of Mars on Twitter. Um, at the conclusion of her presentation tonight, we will be able to take questions from the audience. So uh, you're watching at home on YouTube and in the comments section there, if you have any questions for Tanya, you can enter them in there. Uh, that'll be towards the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll remind you all again on that. But without any further ado, please welcome to the stream tonight, Dr. Tanya Harrison. Tanya, Hi. how are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us tonight. Where are you? Uh, where are you joining us from? I am in Washington D.C. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you for uh, being up late with us. I know the time difference can uh, be a little weird when we do these things, uh, but we certainly appreciate it. Um, with that, Tanya, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you run the show from here. Great. Thanks so much. All right. And thanks everybody for for dialing in tonight. Um, so I may live in Washington, D.C. now, but I grew up in Seattle. And so the Museum of Flight was definitely one of my favorite places to go as a kid because I was a space nerd from a pretty young age. So it's always fun to be able to do things with the museum now. So uh, I work for a company called Planet Imaging the Earth, but most of my career but before the last two years I've worked at Planet, I worked on Mars. And so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about what we can learn about imaging planets by imaging them from space. So like Kale said in my introduction, I, I'm a professional Martian. Uh, I've worked in mission operations for a bunch of the missions that Kale listed. And on these missions, I worked on the camera systems. And so I worked in the context of a geologist. So what are we seeing in these images that's important about the history of the planet that we're looking at, either Earth or Mars? And is there anything that we're seeing in the images from an engineering standpoint that tells us how these cameras are functioning? Are they doing okay or is there something wrong? But I'm also a storyteller via satellites because my specialization in geology is actually something called geomorphology. And I'm guessing this is probably not a word many of you have heard. It's, it's uh, not super common, I think, outside of geology. But I basically look at shapes of things in satellite images and I figure out how these things relate to each other. You know, what is sitting on top of what? What do they look like relative to other things in the image or other things that you might see on the surface of the planet to tell you about the history of what you're looking at? This is a really powerful thing to be able to do. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like. This is a picture from the context camera or CTX on NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this was the first camera that I've worked in operations for. It takes these grayscale images of Mars to be a context image for the higher resolution high rise camera, which if you've ever seen any of the really striking color images that have come from Mars in the past decade or so, it's probably an image from high rise. It's a really great camera. So if you're not a geologist, you might look at this picture and it doesn't really look like much. You've got some craters all over one half. The other half is weirdly smooth. But if you're a geologist, this picture is telling you a lot about millions and millions of years of the history of Mars. So we can say the first thing that happened is that this large crater formed because this circular feature, anything that's pretty circular, tends to either be a crater or the caldera of a volcano. And we can tell from kind of zooming out and taking a context view beyond what we can just see in this image that this probably is a crater. It doesn't look like this was a volcano. But then at some point, 
a volcano that is nearby erupted and the lava flow buried this crater. So the crater doesn't look well defined anymore. You can just kind of see where the edge is. It's like the memory that the crater was there. Um, and then you have a bunch of other craters that formed on top of that, but they're also pretty heavily eroded. They don't look nice and sharp. Like say, if you've ever seen an image of meteor crater here on earth, that really nice sharp bowl shape, you've kind of lost that in a lot of these craters on this lighter side of the image. And then at some point, millions of years later, another nearby volcano erupts and forms this darker flow that has this edge right here. We can tell that this is millions of years later because the way that we date things on places like Mars or the moon are by crater density counts. So the idea here is that the longer that a surface has been sitting out exposed to space, the older that it probably is because it's had more time to collect craters on it. And so if we see a surface that has a lot of craters and specifically a lot of big craters, it's probably older than a surface that has fewer craters on it. And the idea about the size of craters is tied to the fact that when the solar system was younger, there was a lot of big stuff flying around. And as the universe aged, a lot of that big stuff globbed together to form the planets. And so we don't have a lot of big things just randomly flying through the solar system anymore. They've all either accreted into the planets or they've smashed into the planets to form craters like these, or they hang out in very specific orbits like the asteroid belt or places where we see the Trojan asteroids. Um, so since this dark lava flow here has very, very few craters on it, it's probably relatively young in the geologic sense. But then we've got this guy here, which looks really weird. So if we zoom in on this in the high rise view, which is much higher resolution, here's that crater. It looks really nicely defined. The edge of it is super sharp and we can zoom in even more. And there's a lot of boulders here on what we call the ejecta blanket. So the stuff that that crater shot out and splashed all over the surface. We know from craters on earth that these boulders erode away very quickly again, in the geologic sense, so millions of years, uh, not, not so, quite so quickly to most of society anymore. But um, because we see these here, this crater is probably relatively young between that and the fact that the rim is still really sharp. But we can also see that the ejecta blanket of this crater is actually on top of that older lava flow. So probably another many millions of years after the darker flow formed, this crater formed and put this stuff on top of the edge of the flow. So we have big crater, lighter toned, older lava flow, darker toned, younger lava flow, and then this young crater forms. So here we have probably tens to hundreds of millions of years of Martian history encapsulated in literally five different features that we can see on the surface. So it's pretty amazing. So I mentioned before, um, I worked in operations for the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and this is what that context camera looks like. Here's a, a little Swiss Army knife for scale. So it's not a very big camera. And we use it to take these images of Mars that are generally about 30 kilometers wide and up to 120, 130 kilometers long. And uh, part of my job was literally to pick what these cameras took pictures of. And that was probably the coolest job I've ever had and ever will have because not many people get to take pictures of another planet every day as their job. And it, it blew my mind every single day. And so this is actually the first image that I ever got to take of Mars with CTX. And this is an area on the southern flanks of this large volcano called Arcea Mons. So this is a bunch of pits. Uh, there's some landslides in the pits here. So I'm really glad that my first image of Mars was not some boring, broad, smooth plane that had no features on it what to, uh, to speak of because a lot of the northern hemisphere is pretty, pretty bland. So part of what we did with the context camera was look for changes on the surface of Mars. And sometimes we did this intentionally and sometimes we found these changes by accident. So this is a case where this is the vent of a small volcano and we were trying to take stereo imagery. So we needed to take two pictures of the same spot that were taken with the spacecraft pointed at it from different angles. And that way you can combine those two images and create a 3D view. That tells you a lot about things like the texture of this lava flow that was coming out of that volcano probably hundreds of millions of years ago. So we took the first image for that stereo pair on the 7th of September in 2008. We came back over it on the 30th of September and sometime in those three weeks or so, this dark splotch formed. We couldn't really see what it was at the resolution of CTX, which is six meters per pixel, which means you can resolve things on the ground. They're about 18 meters in any dimension. So this is when we call in that high-rise camera again, which has a resolution of about 25 centimeters per pixel. 
and it was able to see that crater really clearly. So the crater here is the round part, and then the darker area is what we call the blast zone. So these craters are small enough that they don't really have much of an ejecta blanket like we saw on the, the, the slide with the lava flows. This actually forms from the shock wave of the asteroid coming in, and it doesn't usually even hit the ground. It sort of explodes before it gets to that point. And then it sprays all of the dust off of the surface near the crater and leaves this dark splotch behind because underneath that red dust of Mars, the surface is a little bit darker and kind of gray, so it looks more like the moon. This is another case where we saw some changes on the surface where we were trying to collect that 3D stereo data and something got in the way. So here was a view of this uh, channel coming into a crater here. And we were really interested in this because there's this fan-shaped feature here at the end of this channel. And those usually form when you have water flowing through like a river channel where it empties into a standing body of water like a lake or a bay. A really good example of this on Earth is the southern part of the state of Louisiana is actually the delta for the Mississippi River. So if you go in something like Google Maps and you zoom way out in the satellite view, you'll actually see this really beautiful fan shape for all of the southern part of Louisiana. It's like a textbook view of a delta. That's what we call these things. Um, when we came back to take the second image, this little dust storm got in the way. And so these lines here are actually streamers of dust that were being lofted off the surface. And then the dust kind of poofs out when it hits a certain altitude in the atmosphere. So then we came back again in November, about a month later, to try to finish this stereo pair. And the dust storm was gone. These tend don't tend to stick around for very long unless you've got a global dust storm going on. Um, and the interesting thing was, even though there was a lot of dust being lifted off the surface in this view, we didn't see many changes between the before image and the after image of the storm, which means it didn't significantly move much dust around on the surface. It just kind of blew it around a little bit like over the same area. And so one of the things that we discovered with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that we hadn't really seen with previous missions like Viking or Mars Global Surveyor, which uh, Viking operated in the 70s into the early 80s, and Mars Global Surveyor operated from 1996 to 2006. So it actually overlapped with Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter for a few months before um, we unfortunately lost contact with Mars Global Surveyor. Um, but we didn't really have an idea of just how dynamic Mars is until we had Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, because now we were collecting so much data and we had so much repeat coverage in certain areas. And we could compare that coverage to the older images like Viking, um, Mars Odyssey and Mars Global Surveyor. So one of the things that we kept an eye on was how the polar caps change from season to season. So uh, we have two pieces of both of the caps of Mars, the permanent polar cap, which is the part that sticks around year after year. And then there's the seasonal polar cap, which is made up of frost that deposits around the edge of the polar cap as you go from fall into winter. And then when you move from spring into summer, that seasonal cap actually sublimates away. So it goes straight from ice to being vapor in the atmosphere without ever melting to form a liquid, generally speaking. Um, and then it comes back to looking like what it does in the summer. We've even caught avalanches as they were happening on Mars, which is pretty amazing because that's hard enough to do on Earth. Um, this is an avalanche of dust coming off the edge of the northern polar cap. So these layers here are layers of ice and dust in the polar cap in about this area in here, this big chasm. And not only did we catch this in motion, but we got really good at figuring out where exactly on the cap they happened and what time of year they happened so that we could actually proactively look for them and count them year after year. And so at this point, we've actually captured dozens of these in motion, which is pretty incredible. We've got new impact craters like the stuff we saw before, and we caught these things. These are called recurring slope lineae. And these are dark streaks that form on warm slopes, usually in the middle of summer, and they grow incrementally down slope, and then at some point stop and then slowly fade away. That tells us that there's probably liquid involved in their formation somehow, because usually a dry landslide is sort of a one and done kind of thing. It all fails really quickly, and then the ground stops moving. Something like a dry dust avalanche doesn't grow slowly like this from what we know on Earth, at least, and in lab experiments. So what we think this might be is flows of extremely salty water, where the water is so salty that it has lowered the freezing point of the water to something like negative 70, negative 80 degrees so that it can actually stay liquid on the surface of Mars. Because right now, 
the surface temperature and pressure on Mars is not conducive to keeping water liquid for more than a few minutes to a few hours, depending on exactly where you are. This is a huge deal because on Earth, anywhere there's water, there's usually something that has managed to survive there regardless of how harsh the conditions are. So this has huge implications for astrobiology, for the search for life beyond Earth. We can also do what we call on Earth tip and cue, but we can do it for Mars. And so new craters are a really good example of where we do this. We spot something in the lower resolution data with the context camera. So this is another example where we happen to catch an image in June of 2008, and it's just kind of this broad, dusty plane, not very much exciting going on. Uh, we happen to catch another image two months later, and there was this sort of buckshot pattern of dark spots. We know from experience these are probably craters, but sometimes you can get uh, little dust clearing events that blow off dust in things that kind of look like a crater at this resolution, but when you shoot it with the high res resolution, um, it's actually not. So we need high res to confirm it for us. So this is a zoomed in color view, and it might be a little bit hard to see on your machine because of the weird colors that we have here, but there are tiny craters in here. But the weird thing is when we zoomed in even more, some of these craters had this whitish blue stuff in them, which we had never seen before in a new impact crater. So we got another instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter called CRISM, which is a hyperspectral imaging uh, system. So what it does is it takes pictures with wavelengths of light far beyond what humans can see, and it tells us more about what rocks are made out of. And it was able to tell us that this whitish blue stuff was actually ice. And this was a huge deal because scientists had hypothesized for many years that there was this thick layer of ice in the northern latitudes of Mars just below the surface, but we'd never directly observed it before until this. And so after this, we started monitoring certain areas across the northern plains of Mars. When I was working on the mission, I think we had something like maybe 15 or 20 sites that we actively monitored to see if we could find more of these craters. And we found more of them. And the almost depressing part was we found some that formed not very far away from the Viking 2 landing site, which is a lander that landed in uh, mid 1970s. So maybe if that lander had had the ability to dig, you know, just a little bit deeper on Mars, we would have discovered this ice back in the 70s instead of in the 2000s. And one really cool thing that we have at Mars that I think even a lot of the Mars science community doesn't realize we have is that we've been doing daily global imaging of Mars almost every single day from 1997 until today. We started with image, images from the Mars Orbiter camera on Mars Global Surveyor, and that was mostly to monitor the weather on Mars and changes in what we call the albedo patterns. So you'll notice that some areas on Mars are sort of this stereotypical red color or reddish brown, and then there's some areas that look sort of dark blue. The dark blue areas are places that are not very dusty, and then the redder areas are the places that are covered in that ubiquitous Martian dust. And the patterns of this change over time based on things like global dust storms. So we monitor these changes and we monitor the weather to keep the rover safe. So these images are from the successor to the Mars Orbiter camera on a camera called Marcy, the Mars Color Imager, which is aboard MRO. And so for this camera, my job was actually to be a Martian weather girl. I monitored the weather. I wrote weather reports every week. Um, if there were storms headed toward any of the rovers like Spirit and Opportunity or the landers like Phoenix, I would give those teams a heads up and say, hey, you know, don't do any sensitive things right now because uh, your power levels might be really low. It's going to be really dusty. Or in some cases, hey, you need to close your dust covers because this storm is coming your way and it, this looks like it's going to be a bad one. But obviously landers can't move and the rovers can't move fast enough to get out of the way of a storm. So you just kind of have to batten down the hatches and see what happens. So this is actually a video of one year of weather on Mars from Marcy. And uh, there's some little artifacts in here from the way that the camera works. So the black gaps that you're seeing are places where the spacecraft was pointed more than eight degrees off of pointing straight down. So we could use other instruments on board to take data. And unfortunately, Marcy can only collect images plus or minus eight degrees off pointing straight down. And the lens on this camera is a fisheye lens and it has about eight or nine different filters on it. And so those filters don't line up at the edges of the fisheye. So you get this little color fringing effect sometimes where you'll see those pink and green spots. Here, 
This is actually the beginning of a giant global dust storm from 2007. You'll notice the surface kind of disappeared. The only things you can really make out well are these dark spots here. This is Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. And then these are the three we call Tharsis Montes. These are also three really large volcanoes. Those pretty much stand out during global dust storms only because they're so tall, they, they almost poke out of the top of the atmosphere. It's really crazy. Um, up here, we have a ton of weather activity that's going on along the edge of the northern polar cap which is receding at this point because we're going into um, springtime into summer in the Northern Hemisphere. And that temperature difference between the ice-covered ground and the ice-free ground causes all these wind patterns to come off of the ice toward the places where there is no ice, which is very similar to like land breeze and sea breeze on the earth. These wispy white areas, these are all water ice clouds. So they like to hang out over the tops of the large volcanoes. This is really similar to if you've ever looked at Mount Rainier and you see those kind of almost UFO shaped clouds hanging out over the top of them or just clouds in general over Mount Rainier or any of the Cascades. These are what we call orographic clouds. It's because the air moves up over the mountains and if they're tall enough, it kind of pushes the moisture out of the air, it makes it condense into the form of clouds. And so there is enough moisture in the form of water in the Martian atmosphere for that to happen over these big volcanoes. This over here is another big volcano called Elysium. Um, and it's got those clouds over it as well. And then anywhere we see these like pink, pinkish orange wispy areas, those are dust storms. So all through here, and then there's a big dust storm here too. So our goal with CTX was we really wanted to image all of Mars at six meter resolution, which is pretty unprecedented for anywhere in the solar system. And we managed to hit 99% coverage in March of 2017. But Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter went into orbit of Mars in November of 20, or sorry, of 2006. So it took 11 years to reach 99% coverage of the entire planet at six meter resolution. That's a really long time. Part of it is because of the size of the images. You can kind of see, let's see if there's a good example here. You can kind of see in these gaps a little bit of an idea of how big some of the images are. So each individual image is not huge compared to the whole size of the planet because it's such high resolution. But the surface area of Mars is much smaller than the Earth. So why does it take us so long to image the whole thing? Well, part of it is download speed. So I ran this internet test at my house and uh, I have about 51 megabit per second download speed. So this is really fast. But the speed that we get data back from Mars depends on how close Mars and Earth are to each other in, these or in their orbits. Right now, Mars is about 245 million miles away or 22 light minutes, which is almost as far as it ever gets from Earth. And this means that our data speed is really low. So right now, the deep space network, which is what gets all the data back from planets uh, where we have missions at them right now, is receiving data from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter at one megabit per second. So 50 times slower than my internet in DC. That is really, really slow. So this has a huge impact on how many images you can send back per day. With the context camera, when Mars and Earth were really close to each other, we could send back anywhere from maybe three to 400 images every single day. But when Mars and Earth were most distant from each other, which is usually when they're on opposite sides of the sun, like right now, we could send back sometimes less than 10 images a day. I would come in in the morning every once in a while and get an email and it'd be like, you have three images to review. That was really depressing because you'd say, well, what do I do with the rest of my day? It's really, really quick to go through three images. And like I said, part of this is because of limitations of uh, the downlink speed, but part of it is also because we have a limited number of what we call ground stations or satellite dishes here to actually receive that data. So there's three places where we have ground stations on the Earth to collect data from every single mission that is beyond Earth orbit. Uh, there's one in California, there's one in Madrid, and there's one in Australia. And in each of those, there's a, a set of these dishes. So here's like a view of what these dishes look like. You can actually go to eyes.nasa.gov slash DSN to look at this deep space network now, and it will show you what missions all of the dishes are talking to at any given moment. So when I took the screen cap, they were talking to Voyager 1, which is outside the solar system. This one is Juno, which is at Jupiter. Uh, this is talking to a lot of the different Mars missions, Mars Constance Orbiter, the MAVEN mission, uh, MSL is the Curiosity rover, 
Um, there's another dish in Australia also talking to some Mars missions. So these are designed so that at any given time, at least one of these dishes is pointed toward any of the missions that we have out there that we want to talk to. So we can make sure that we can get the data back and we know exactly where they are. But this means you have a ton of missions that are competing for a limited number of satellite dishes. And some of the dishes are 70 meter diameter and some of the other ones are 34 meter diameter. So obviously if your dish is bigger, you get more data back than if you're using a smaller dish. So we need to save big dishes for things like Voyager because it's so far away that the data rate is really, um, really low. And we use the big dishes usually for brand new missions because we want to get back as much data as we can in what we call the primary mission phase, which is the only time that they are actually guaranteed funding. After that, we have to basically reapply for funding every year or two years to keep the missions going. So because of all of this, we have to do what's called data triage. Of course, we would love to image, you know, a hundred different things on the planet all the time. We'd love to image the whole planet every day, but we can't because we just can't send all that data back. So on any given day, we have to make smart decisions about what we're going to shoot. So uh, I think some people think that we just operate these cameras, like either the satellite does it itself or we're just imaging whatever we fly over, but no, there's actually a human in the loop in pretty much all of these decisions. So if we were looking at Mars in a view like this, I would say I'm not going to image these places right now because they're really cloudy. And so that means the images that we would take there wouldn't look very good. There's plenty of other places on Mars on this particular day that were not cloudy. Let's focus on those instead. This here, this is a really interesting feature. This is called Valles Marineris, which is the largest valley system in the entire solar system. It's actually wider than the entire United States um, east-west. So this is something that we definitely made a high priority early in the mission. And it's not very cloudy right now, so cool. We'll take some pictures here. Of all the big volcanoes, so this is Olympus Mons, these are those Tharsis Montes again. The, the middle one of the Tharsis Montes is not very cloudy, so maybe we'll take some pictures there. The northern polar cap is pretty clear, but you could take some images there too. These broad, smooth plains in the northern hemisphere, they're not super exciting compared to, say, the polar cap or a volcano or Valles Marineris. So we'll make those lower priority. We maybe don't wanna shoot them right now. You also wanna think about time of year. So you want shadows to be your friend. And a good example of this is in the Southern hemisphere, the nor in fall, the Northern wall of craters is in really deep shadow. So if you're trying to look at something that's on the Northern wall of craters, you won't be able to see it. So that means don't waste your time shooting those craters in fall, wait until spring the following year to, to shoot those craters. So there's a lot of decisions that come in when you're trying to make, make your mind up. So you have to prioritize your data collection based on whatever bandwidth you have available. With the rovers, we do it a little bit differently. They actually have storage on board so we can collect more data every day than we have the ability to send back. And then we send back these tiny thumbnails that are like 256 by 256 pixels. And then we decide from those based on how many images we can send back today, which ones do we wanna send back versus which ones will we wait till we have more bandwidth to send back later. So these are just a few raw images from uh, Curiosity. And we would say, we don't necessarily need that one because it's really similar to some of the other ones. That one's also kind of similar. So we'll make that low priority. We'll, we don't really need pictures of the sky right now because the bandwidth's really low. If we need those later, we'll save them in storage and send them. And then maybe we'll get rid of that one because it's mostly the sky. So we don't have the ability to do this on the satellites, but we can do this with the rovers, at least with Curiosity and Perseverance. So the fact that you have to do all this data triage, how does this limit the speed of insight for the things that you're learning on Mars? As an example, those uh, recurring slope lineae that we saw earlier, those briny salty water flows, we didn't discover those until five or six years into the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission. That's actually passed to the primary mission phase. So if our mission had been cut off at the end of two Mars years, or sorry, one Mars year, which is two Earth years, we never would have made that discovery the avalanche is coming off the northern polar cap. That was another discovery that wasn't made until years into the mission, which we might not have ever seen if the mission didn't go on for, you know, five, 10 years at this point. On Earth, we don't have that problem because we have tons of satellites orbiting the Earth all the time, sending back data at extremely high data rates because low Earth orbit is right there. Um, when I was working in operations on the Opportunity Rover, I was working at Arizona State University and I learned of this company, Planet, that really intrigued me because their goal was to image the whole Earth every day to look for change. 
And since my job for Mars had been to image most of Mars to look for change with context camera, or all of Mars to look for change with Mars color imager, I thought it was cool that there was a company that wanted to do this and the company sounded super cool. And they were doing this with these tiny satellites. So this is an actual size. This is a CubeSat. That's what we call 3U. So it's about the size of a loaf of bread until you unfold the solar panels. Um, and we have a bunch of these in orbit right now. And so they actually image the entire landmass of the Earth every day. So if you think about that map we had of Mars that took 11 years to create, compare that to one day of data from planet. This is coverage that would make any Mars scientist cry. And this, this data is at three meter resolution. So this is daily coverage of the entire landmass of the Earth at a higher resolution than we have with that context camera at Mars that took us 11 years to put together. I just thought this was beautiful when I saw it. And so the way that we're able to do this, along with the high data rate, thanks to being close to the Earth, is by taking advantage of the rotation and putting a ton of satellites in an orbit kind of all in a line with each other. And so they are always on. There's not a human in the loop deciding as what these satellites are going to shoot. It's just anytime it's over land, the camera is on. And then when it get, once it gets 15 kilometers offshore anywhere, the camera turns off. Um, so we don't do a lot of open water imaging. But since these are orbiting in a line with each other, they orbit as the Earth spins beneath it, and they build up that line-by-line -line coverage like we saw in the previous slide. And we can do it in a bunch of different bands. We also have these SkySat satellites that are more traditional and work kind of like the Mars satellites in that they are tasked by a person. Somebody says, I want an image of this, and then the satellite takes the picture. And this does it at 50 centimeter resolution, which is really high resolution for the Earth, but it's actually lower resolution than the high-rise camera for Mars, which is kind of interesting. So I said before, like for Mars, we could get back anywhere from maybe 10 to 400 images a day because of the, the data rate. With the planet satellites, we can collect 3 million images every single day. This covers 350 million square kilometers, and it equates to about 25 terabytes of data downlinked every single day. This is an incredible amount of data. This is more than any one grad student could go through in their entire career. I used to be really proud of the fact that I knew that I was probably the only human on the entire Earth that had ever looked at every single image that the context camera ever sent back from Mars, because my job was literally to look at all the pictures that we took the day before and then pick the images that we were taking in the future. And then even after I left working on that job, I kept looking at the images while I was working on my PhD. And so I could do that because it was a reasonable number. I mean, it was still a lot of work, but some, somebody like a human could actually still do that. A human can't go through 3 million images a day. And so there's a lot of insights that are locked up in all of that data that are just waiting for people to figure out how do we actually extract all that information. We can also send back a ton of data because instead of being limited to three different locations, we actually have 50, over um, 50 different ground stations, so 50 different satellites at 15 locations spread all around the world. So we can send back data a whole bunch more um, with a whole bunch more opportunities, what we call like flyover passes, than we get maybe with the images that we could send back from Mars. And to keep this many satellites in orbit, we launch satellites every few months, basically just kind of, I think the joke in the space industry is, you know, there's like a ninja that comes in and then stuffs some what we call dove satellites on the missions, anywhere that we can find some extra space. And so we've launched with everybody from SpaceX to Rocket Lab to United Launch Alliance. We've launched from uh, the Indian Space Agency, ISRO. We've launched on Russian rockets. Uh, recently, we launched a multi-year, multi-launch contract with SpaceX. So you'll probably see a lot of SpaceX launches in the near future with, with planet satellites on board. But this is great because the satellites themselves, they are designed to burn up in the atmosphere over a relatively short period of time, you know, maybe uh, a, a year, three years, depending on how long they, they hold on in orbit. But we're constantly upgrading them. And so instead of spending like hundreds of millions of dollars on one giant satellite and operating that for a really long time and that thing can never be upgraded, we're constantly upgrading these tiny and expensive satellites and then just launching more of them at any opportunity that we have. And having this much coverage of the Earth means that we can pull out so many insights to learn how the Earth is changing every single day compared to what we can do on Mars. 
So one of the really big projects that um, was recently in the news from using a lot of this satellite data was something called the Allen Coral Atlas. And this was um, started by Paul Allen and run through his foundation. And the goal here was to map all of the coral reefs in the entire world and then create a living map to watch how they're changing over time to see how they're being impacted by climate change due to things like uh, increasing sea surface temperature or how they're being affected by um, what we would call a discrete event like maybe an oil spill, for example. And so they actually just in the last couple of weeks completed their first global map of these coral reefs. And they do this using a combination of satellite images and going out I guess it's not on the ground, on the water and looking at the coral reefs in certain sites and making physical maps. And then they use that, that information and they say, okay, so we have all these different, these uh, habitat classifications they have here. We know what that looks like on the ground and we can, we can correlate that with what that unit looks like in a satellite image. So then we can take that and extrapolate it to other places in the world where we just can't physically get there with a boat because it's either too expensive or it's really inaccessible or we just don't have enough people to be able to go and do it. So they only went to a limited number of coral reefs on the ground that they could physically get to and then were able to take this methodology and apply it to all the coral reefs in the world. And this is publicly available. So if you Google Allen Coral Atlas, you can actually go and explore all of these coral reefs yourself. The same scientists behind the Al Coral Atlas project, this is mostly run by a guy named Greg Asner out of Arizona State University. He also does something similar to look at deforestation in the Amazon. Um, so he's really interested in looking at how much carbon is locked up in trees in rainforests and then figuring out when you see deforestation on the ground, how much carbon is that releasing into the atmosphere? Because obviously there's a lot of deforestation problems, especially in the rainforests. And so we wanna get an idea of how that's affecting the ecosystem and the, the world as a whole. And so um, Greg Asner actually has his own airplane where he's mounted a LIDAR instrument on board, which is a laser that shoots at the ground. It can use this to measure tree height and tree shape, and then use that to figure out combining that information with the satellite images. Okay, uh, how much carbon do we think is stored in trees of this size with the LIDAR and what does that look like in a satellite image? And then if those trees were gone over a certain area and we see that change from space, how much carbon has been released back into the air? Uh, last summer, the last intact Arctic ice sheet actually collapsed. Um, near the end of July. And this is something where someone at NASA actually called me up and was like, hey, did you manage to get a picture of this? Because we tried, but it was cloudy. And since we have about 200 satellites in orbit right now, it means that in some places we get lots of images per day, like sometimes even multiple images an hour. And so this is a case where this is the ice sheet before it collapsed. And this is the ice sheet after it collapsed. So these are all of the, the fractures. And then over the course of a few days, all of these chunks that cracked floated off into the Arctic Ocean. We had so many images in this area that we were actually able to figure out within a 10 hour time span when this ice, ice sheet collapsed. And we took four different um, groups of images with four different satellites over this area. The satellite images that we took first thing in the morning uh, were these ones. And so it was clear we could actually see the breakup, but all the rest of the images we got that day, including the ones that overlapped with the timing when NASA tried to take the air images about four hours later, I think it was, all of those images were completely cloudy. You couldn't see anything that had happened. So it was really incredible that we just got lucky before the clouds came in and managed to capture this, um, but also extremely depressing that it happened in the first place. So we're capturing a lot of the impacts of climate change, especially in the Arctic and the Antarctic lately. We've also been capturing a lot of natural disasters. So in February of this year, there was a massive flood and landslide in a part of India called Chamoli. And this was a very unusually large event. There are a lot of uh, floods and landslides in the Him Himalayas because it's a steep mountain area, but this landslide and flood was unusually large um, for the area. And it was all over the news because initially folks thought that maybe this was something called a glacial lake outburst flood, which is where you have some melting behind an ice dam in a glacier and it builds up pressure to the point where that ice dam explodes and you have a catastrophic release of water very quickly that can cause these massive floods. 
We actually think this is what carved a lot of features in Eastern Washington called the channeled scablands. There was a, a feature called Glacial Lake Missoula back during the last ice age over in Western Montana. And it was an absolutely massive lake that catastrophically um, released in one of these glacial lake outburst floods. And if you look at um, Google Maps views of Eastern Washington, you'll actually see this huge channel feature that cuts all down the, the Eastern part of Washington, kind of like through Yakima. And then it flows along the Columbia River for a little bit. Um, there's no water in there anymore, but if you have a really keen eye, you can actually see where those scour marks are. And it's possibly the largest catastrophic flood that we have geologic evidence for on the entire planet. But scientists started looking at what triggered this landslide pretty quickly because they just went onto the website and they were looking at planet data. And this researcher, Dan Sugar from the University of Calgary, saw that the features he was seeing didn't look like a glacial lake outburst flood. Um, he saw some uh, dust in the images they wouldn't expect to see. And he saw what we call a landslide scar. So there, the scar that's left behind when the stuff that was on the slope falls off the slope. And so he starts talking to other scientists on Twitter of all places while they're all trying to figure out what caused this event. And he was able to say, no, this was actually a steep hanging glacier that detached and melted on impact. So this is a part of a glacier that was hanging over the edge of a mountain, fell off. It actually fell about two kilometers smashed into the valley floor and the heat of that impact melted that piece of the glacier and it triggered this huge flood. Within a couple of hours of that, another scientist, Scott Watson, combined the planet images with radar data from the space shuttle, which we can use to create three-dimensional views, to actually look at this entire valley and then see like where was the dust that came down the hill? Where was this landslide scar? How far did everything fall? And it was really amazing to see these scientists all working together over social media to solve this mystery. And so they actually reached out to us and said, uh, you know, can you take a look at your images? And we realized that we had two images that were, were taken 27 minutes apart while the landslide was happening. And again, this was complete coincidence. This was just as the Dove satellites happened to be flying over. So the first image, the dust cloud ends around here. This first image is about 10 minutes after the flood started. And one of the things that happened in this flood is that there were two hydroelectric power stations that got destroyed. One of them is about here and the other one is down here. So in these images, in the first one, the flood hadn't reached either one of the power stations yet. In the second one, it had reached the first power station, but it hadn't reached the second one yet. And so we were able to put together an even more um, precise timeline of events. Then we went in with the high resolution SkySat satellites and took a closer view so we could see exactly what happened. And this was the landslide scar that Dan Sugar had seen in the lower resolution data um, the day before. So all of this area, this would have been covered by snow. It would have looked like all of this stuff before, but since the, the glacier and the rocks detached, they fell off the slope, it left the scar behind, hit the valley floor here. And then when it melted, the flood went down this direction. Another thing that we can monitor from space that might not be something familiar to you as being a problem is illegal sand mining. So river sand is actually a really key ingredient in making concrete because river sand tends to be very kind of jagged and pointy compared to something like desert sand that has been smoothed over time from the wind and moving along other sand grains. And so with the fact that the world is urbanizing very quickly, especially in certain developing countries, illegal sand mining has become almost a mafia-like presence. Journalists are being beaten and murdered for reporting on it. There's um, like rings of people that are illegally importing and exporting this stuff. Um, governments are having a hard, hard time keeping, keeping things in order from it. Um, and so we've had people that are actually looking at this activity from space. Uh, if you want to learn more about this problem, a couple of weeks ago, Vice released a really good documentary on YouTube called Vanishing Sand. And it goes into a lot of details about illegal sand mining around the world, um, the problem areas and all of the things that have been happening there. And in this documentary, they featured some researchers from Newcastle University who used planet data and some other Earth observation data sets from satellites 
to actually get an idea of how bad this problem was in uh, specifically the Mekong River in Asia. So one of the things that they were able to do was measure changes in the river elevation. And rivers change in elevation all the time, you know, as water's flowing through, the stuff that's in the river is moving around. So there are natural changes. But they combined looking at those changes in elevation with where they saw mining vessels in the images as well. And so they could say, oh, well, these blue areas here, that's the places where the elevation was decreasing the most. So it's getting, uh, you're seeing those areas correspond with places where the most you have the most boats. So you can say, okay, this is probably an area where illegal sand mining is taking place. They can also estimate the size of the boats and how much volume the sand can carry because they know the size of these boats on the ground. And then they can see those boats and count them in the satellite images and figure out uh, the density of the boats over time. And then figure out from there how much sand is being transported out of the river from month to month. And what they're seeing is that not only is the amount of sand that's being mined out of the Mekong River increasing, it's increasing really rapidly and it's being mined much more quickly than nature is replenishing the sand. And it doesn't take a scientist or a math expert to say, if you're taking something away faster than it's being replenished, that's a problem and eventually you're gonna run out of that resource. So this is something that is happening in a bunch of different rivers around the world. It's a huge problem because it causes a lot of danger, not only to the people that are involved in the mining and you know the journalists that are reporting on it, like I said before, but it impacts the local people that are living along the banks of that river because it can create areas that are more prone to flooding and it messes up all of the local ecosystems as well. This is an example where we captured some pretty major changes from a magnitude 7.8 earthquake in Indonesia. So this is before and after, and all of this mud flowed into this river and then out into this bay here. And if we zoom in, you might notice like here, there's a dock that disappears, for example. There's some changes over here along the shoreline. This is an area that got really badly flooded. Let's take a closer look. One of the things it did was it triggered a bunch of mud flows. So this is the before and then the after, here's the mud flow here. So it destroyed a lot of um, houses and buildings here and some roads. And we can zoom in we can see places like damaged houses along the beach. We can see this bridge was washed out here. You can see here, there's some flooding inland that probably destroyed a lot of buildings. And you can see all of that um, debris that was inside the river. We were also able to see a lot of the impacts of the shutdowns from COVID from space too. So you might've seen on the news, there was a lot of media coverage over the clearing of the canals in Venice. Um, there was a thing that went viral about something like dolphins returning to the canals of Venice. That was uh, not true. So don't believe everything you see on the internet, but the canals themselves did clear up quite a bit. So this is a view shortly before the world shut down in February of 2020. And these are all boats going through the canals here. There's some boats up here as well. A lot of boats around here. And if we switch forward just less than a month later, there's way fewer boats. The water is much more blue. You can actually start to see some of the features under the water. Um, and you can do this in some places where the water is really still and calm on normal days of the earth, but you can't always see this deep, so to speak, into the canals of Venice. And if we zoom in kind of on this area here, this is sort of a typical day in the fall in Venice, tons of boats out here. And you'll notice the water uh, looks kind of like whitish blue. This is because it's really turbid. Those boats are kicking up a lot of waves. And this is what it looked like during the shutdown. The water looks completely different because it's so still from the boats not going around. You've got a couple of boats, but not very much compared to what we had before. You might've also seen on the news that there were airplanes piling up at airports all around when um, people weren't flying anywhere. So this is a view of um, an airport in Alabama before and during the pandemic. So you can see a huge increase in the number of planes. Suddenly all of this area here is full. There's also little planes that got parked out here. This is another view from uh, an air park in Arizona before the shutdown in January and then during. So again, lots more planes parked up at this airport. 
And since we have so much data coming back from space, you know, we're getting 3 million plus images a day just from these satellites. And then you have tons of other satellites that are operated by, you know, NASA, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, Russia has their own satellites. There's so much data out there. We really need to find ways to harness all of that. And things like machine learning and artificial intelligence are a really cool way of being able to pull more insights out of the data than you would be able to get if you were just a human trying to look at the images because we can process way more data. And we can combine that satellite data with data from other sources on the ground to do some really cool stuff. And one of the most interesting things that I've seen recently was this group out of Duke University that was actually using satellite images to measure air quality. So these pictures themselves don't directly tell you what the air quality measurement is because you're not imaging at the right wavelengths to actually get that information. But what you can do is combine these images with data from air quality monitoring stations on the ground. And you can figure out sort of like that Alan Coral Atlas example, what does a pixel of a specific area look like when the air quality level is X? And that's exactly what this group did. So they took images of Beijing and they looked at what every piece of things like buildings and vegetation and water looked like under different air quality levels where they got those measurements on the ground. And then they used some machine learning techniques. There's some big words in here. So if you don't know what they mean, that's totally fine. But there's this something called a convolutional neural network that's used a lot in machine learning and another thing called a random forest regressor, which is also very commonly used in machine learning to combine all these data sets together. And from that, they could say, OK, we know now how hazy an, a pixel is in an image when it corresponds to this pr particular air quality level. So now we can take this model and apply it somewhere where we don't have those air quality levels on the ground and we can guess, well, not really guess, we can estimate um, what the air quality reading might be. So they did this over Beijing, they got really good results, and then they trained, they ran their model over Shanghai without having to retrain the model and also got really good results. So it tells us that their model would work, would work really well over any city that looks very similar to Beijing or Shanghai, meaning the buildings are kind of the same color, the vegetation is the same color. You might have to retrain it if you were looking at, say, um, an older village in Europe where you have a lot of red roofed buildings compared to you know, an urban center like Beijing or New York or San Francisco, where you might have a lot of like grayish silver skyscrapers that affect your images. But we're working on new satellites that will actually get us some of that atmospheric information. And this thing that we're working on now is called Carbon Mapper. And this is something that we're doing with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California where um, we're building the satellite piece of this and then JPL is giving us their hyperspectral imager. So very similar to that one we used on Mars to identify the ice. But this one is designed to help us look for greenhouse gas emissions on the earth. Um, we're really interested in methane emissions because those are a big contributor to um, global warming and greenhouse gases. But we can look at other things in the atmosphere as well with this. So the first one of these should be launching in, um, or sorry, the first two will be launching in 2023. And then we're going to build up a whole constellation of them between 2023 and 2024, 25 timeline, um, so that we can get a lot more data of um, just looking at where all of these emissions are coming from. So I like to leave everybody with this thought uh, when they see presentations like this is if you could see daily change of anything on the Earth or Mars or really anywhere in the solar system, what would you do? What would you study? What would you be most interested in learning about? And I'd love to see some of your answers in the chat. And uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to take them. I know we've got a few minutes left. First of all, Tanya, thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. Um, just a just a wealth of, of interesting uh, uh, information in there, uh, and everybody. Yes, uh, as as Tanya mentioned, if you have questions for her, please do enter them in the chat. Uh, they're on YouTube. I see a couple coming in already. I'm going to start off with um, a couple Tanya that came to mind while you were talking. Uh, first one, just a real short one. Are you officially the first uh, real time Mars meteorologist then, when you were uh, <laughs> doing your weather predictions? I don't know if I could say I was the first because we did have two other people on the team and we would switch off from week to week. So they did start eight months before I did. So I think uh, one of them technically gets the credit. Very well, all right. Top top five at least, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of MRO, uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, so that launched in 2005, correct? 
Yeah, I think launched in 2005 and then got to Mars in 2006. And, and so I imagine it was being built for a few years before then. So the, the camera technology on MRO is at this point, you know, it's going to be three decades old here soon, I imagine. Is there any um, uh, plan to replace it or send upgraded? Could we, could we get better resolution with modern cameras now, I guess is my question. That's a great question. Um, I mean, 25 centimeter per pixel is still really incredible. And a lot of the limitation is the size of the telescope. If you want to build something that will get you even higher resolution than that, you're talking about building something that's like the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. So Hubble, if you turned it around and pointed at the Earth, for example, would give you something like seven to 10 centimeter resolution images. Um, there are probably some Hubbles that are pointed at the earth. We just don't get to know about them. <laughs> that's like, that's like can read the license plate on your car resolution, right? Yeah. And that gets into the realm where like commercial space companies aren't even allowed to operate only the government. I think the cutoff is technically like 25 or 20 centimeters. Anything below that uh, is only in like the government realm. Oh, wow. Um, would that kind of resolution make a difference for earth monitoring? Um, higher, a higher resolution than you legally allowed access to? I mean, certainly like high resolution is really fantastic because the higher the resolution is, the more like it is, it's more like you're on the ground there. But there's always trade-offs between um, the higher your spatial resolution is, usually the smaller the footprint of the image because you can't take giant images at super high resolution. Otherwise you'd have to have a humongous sensor and a humongous telescope. Um, and so if those footprints are smaller, that also means that your temporal resolution is lower because it takes longer for you to build up that coverage and have repeat coverage of the same area. So having the low resolution coverage that at least tells you like where are the interesting things and then have that inform where to take the high resolution data on both Earth and Mars is super useful because then you kind of get the best of both worlds. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I have one more quick question then I'm going to turn to the audience questions that we're getting and we're getting a lot of them. Um, you were talking about that flood in India and then the, um, uh, the, uh, the flood in, uh, Washington way, way, way back when that glacial outburst flood, are there any current glacial lakes that are being monitored right now for potential outburst floods? Um, they, they do happen in Iceland. I, I wouldn't say frequently, but it is a thing that occurs there quite a bit relative to the rest of the world. Um, and as temperatures increase in places where we have a lot of glaciers, it's certainly something where we'd want to keep an eye out, like Alaska, um, maybe even in the Cascades, um, because it is something that could become a problem. OK, one more thing to worry about. All right, um, <laughs> moving on to some audience questions here. Uh, uh, Alan asks, do Mars quakes happen on Mars? And if so, how often at what and at what magnitude? Um, is that something you'd be able to see um, with MRO? So we actually discovered Mars quakes with the InSight lander, which landed near the end of 2018. Um, and its goal was to look for Mars quakes. And it's discovered hundreds of them at this point. And they're anywhere from magnitude three to four. So they're strong enough that you would feel them. If you were standing there next to InSight, it would kind of feel like a big semi-truck drove by your house. Um, and just a few days ago, they announced that they had a magnitude 4.2 earthquake, which is the largest one that they've discovered on Mars to date. Excellent. Um, <laughs> a uh, colleague of mine says he would love to see the Boeing 737 MAX storage that built up around uh, <laughs> Boeing Field in Seattle from above as well also. I think that's mostly cleared out at this point. Um, do you have enough resolution to track animal migration on your on your Earth monitoring satellites? It depends. It, it depends on how much evidence the animals leave behind. So we can see some places like, uh, I didn't include it in this talk, but we have a really nice animation of wildebeests eating their way across a certain part of Africa because you can see the change in the vegetation from where they were, but you can't actually see the tracks or the wildebeest themselves, for example. Um, there's similar things you can see in Australia with like wombat migration. You can't see the wombats, but you can see the you know destruction, so to speak, that they leave behind where they eat everything. Um, 
you can with the high resolution, like the SkySat data, sometimes you can make out larger animals. Like we've seen um, pods of whales if they're close enough to the surface, which is really cool. But catching them can be tricky. Like you have to be monitoring areas where you think they're migrating or uh, see them on the ground and have somebody be like, shoot this area now. <laughs> Excellent. Um, are there any projects aimed at increasing the bandwidth of the deep space network? Oh. I think any planetary scientist would say, I wish so, but <laughs> unfortunately, just like Earth um, in space, our infrastructure investments are not as good as they should be. And it's too bad because we are severely limiting the amount of data that we can collect with these missions. And like for MRO, for example, we can collect something like 10 times more data than we're physically able to send back just because of bandwidth limitations. So if we had more dishes and especially more of those 70 meter dishes, we could get so much more science back, um, but they're also extremely expensive to build and really expensive to operate. So it, it can be tricky. It'd be great if some you know space billionaire would wanna build some ground stations. <laughs> I, I wonder, it makes me wonder at what point you get better bandwidth just taking a camera to Mars, taking a bunch of pictures and just bringing the hard drive back, <laughs> back to earth, right? As opposed to waiting for it to transmit. Um, That's a good question. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there's an actual there's an actual like cost effective uh, threshold there somewhere. But um, are solar flares observable and predictable with the Earth or Mars satellite coverage? Um, not from like Earth observing or Mars observing satellites, but we do have solar observing satellites that are not necessarily orbiting the Earth, but things like the um, Parker Solar Probe and the uh, I'm blanking out on the other solar mission, Discover. There's a few different solar observing missions where we can actually monitor for these things. And then when you see like solar activity increasing, you can keep an eye out for it, like to see if it's gonna affect any assets in Earth orbit or Mars orbit. Um, and we did have one very large solar flare that hit Mars uh, a couple of years ago or so, because our curiosity got data back and they were trying to figure out what the radiation levels were on the surface and if it was going to be hazardous to humans. And luckily it didn't end up being like a, oh, that one event will kill all the astronauts. It was, you might want to hide somewhere, but <laughs> it's not going to like immediately kill you. So that was good to know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hey, I know it's, uh, we're a little past seven here on the West Coast. I don't want to take up uh, the entirety of your night, Tanya, and I do appreciate you sticking around. Um, you okay for a few more questions? Oh yeah, sure. Excellent. Um, here's a good one. Uh, to what extent do many satellites in orbit, uh, Earth orbit, cause problems for ground-based astronomy? That's a good question. It's certainly been in the news a lot lately with things like Starlink um, and these talks of like mega constellations where we have companies that want to launch hundreds or thousands of satellites. Um, right now, you can sort of in a lot of cases plan around them because usually the satellites will only really get in the way in terms of light during specific hours, like kind of near sunset and sunrise because that's when they might catch the sun glint and you can see them. Um, the Starlink satellites have posed a little bit more of an issue than that. And so SpaceX is actually working on designing like some sun shield uh, designs for future ones. Um, but it might cause more of a problem down the line if you do have like tens of thousands of satellites, it makes it harder to work around them and say, okay, you know, what time of day can I observe this part of the sky where something isn't gonna fly through and, and ruin my observation. Does that create uh, animosity between ground-based <laughs> observers and, and satellite companies? Is that a point of contention or is there a good, do you think there's a good strong working relationship there where, where solutions can be found? Um, it doesn't seem like there's a good working relationship yet, uh, from the way I see astronomers talk about Starlink, for example. Um, it, and it is something where I think like maybe community consultation beforehand or like some thought into what the impact might be would be good. Um, because all of these things do impact each other. The next question coming up here was a, a person said they were at Amos last week and there was a lot of discussion around space traffic management and space debris. Uh, putting you on the spot here, how does Planet plan to handle these issues uh, with their constellations moving forward? You said those those Dove satellites have a pretty short lifespan. Yeah, so they're in a low enough orbit that they burn up after anywhere from like 
eight months to a couple of years or so, just to, depending on how, how long they hang on. So we're not working to get to a point where there's like tens of thousands of satellites. It's more like, how many do we need to do that daily global coverage? And then as the older satellites deorbit, we launch new ones to replace those ones. And then they, those ones have like the upgraded specs and stuff. So that way we're not just operating a bunch of old satellites with old outdated technology. Um, we also, there was another constellation that we operated called RapidEye where that was a set of like five satellites that reached the end of their operational lifespan. And so to be proactive, we deorbited those to burn them up in the atmosphere. So when we still had enough fuel in them to actually control that descent to, to a lower orbit. Um, so we try to be really responsible about like having a plan for getting that stuff out of the way. Excellent. Um, another question here, we're going back to Mars for a second, regarding the colonization of Mars, potential colonization of Mars. Uh, is there any chance of finding fresh water and how would that extremely salty water flow that you talked about, um, could it be treated, uh, desalinated for drinking or would it be useful at all to future Mars inhabitants? There's probably not any fresh water that's liquid today. You might be able to find you know, sort of uncontaminated ice that you might be able to melt to form fresh water, but you, it's probably still got some kind of salts in it that we, we would want to remove. We're seeing a lot of things like uh, perchlorate salts on Mars, uh, which are not great for humans. And so you'd really want to get those out of the water. Um, there's also a lot of different types of um, calcium sulfate salts that we see all over the place on Mars. So there's probably some of those hanging around in the ice if we melted them to form water. And certainly what we think is in those those brine flows that I showed before, the recurring slope linea, we think that's some kind of magnesium, like really exotic magnesium salt, because from experiments on the earth, that seems to be the one that depresses the freezing point more than anything else. I imagine that, that those hyper salty flows would be very viscous. Would they be really like thick? Yeah, I would imagine it's kind of like, I don't know, maybe verging on ketchup or something <laughs> like that, because the, the concentration is so dense. That's wild. Um, here's, a, here's another back to Earth monitoring satellites questions. Um, are oil and gas companies using approaches to monitor and minimize methane emissions uh, based on public data from the doves? and or monitoring of the uh, Beijer, uh, uh, Beijing air quality, like what you mentioned by the team at Duke? Um, I'm not sure, because I don't do any work with folks like that. Uh, I would imagine some of them want to keep track of that kind of information because they they need to be held, like they want to know like how to be accountable for some of these things and like know how much they're emitting. Um, so I'd imagine that they're utilizing some of that information, but I don't know exactly how. Gotcha. Okay, we're going to do we're going to do two more questions, one more from the audience, and then one last one that I want to finish on. Um, this this one for you is pretty light. Uh, Tanya, would you like this from the audience? Would you like to become an astronaut and possibly live for a while on Mars? Um, I mean, ideally, yes, I would love <laughs> to go to Mars. I, I want to like walk up to one of the rovers and see it. I mean, I've seen them in person before we sent them to Mars, but I want to go and see it on Mars. That'd be pretty cool and do some geology there but I'm super claustrophobic, so I hate flying. <laughs> so I'm not sure I could actually get onto a spaceship for eight months to go to Mars. <laughs> I, uh, I also do not, weirdly, I work at the Museum of Flight. I'm not a big fan of uh, flying on small aircraft. And so I totally understand uh, <laughs> the, idea of, the idea of riding all the way to Mars sounds uh, like a nightmare. But uh, yeah, being there would be fantastic. Um, so I want to I want to wrap up uh, with this question that I like to ask our uh, our speakers that have these kind of fascinating jobs. Um, I know we have some young people in the audience uh, from from various museum programs that are interested in this kind of work. What advice do you have about education and career pathways uh, for a young person if they wanted to find themselves at a company like Planet someday, or if they were interested in uh, uh, satellite monitoring from space of, of other planets? The cool thing is there's so much going on in space right now. Almost anything that you're interested in, you could probably tie to space. So like at Planet, we have a lot of engineers, but there's also scientists like me. We have software people that write the programs to both control the satellites and to process the images when they come back to Earth. We have graphic designers that make our pretty images. We have salespeople. We have um, administrative people. We've got a cool people team that like keeps everyone happy. Uh, so 
if you want to work in space, you don't necessarily have to be a scientist or an engineer or good at math. I really mm -hmm. suck at math and I still got to work on rovers. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you love space, just think about a way that you can tie the thing that you're interested in to space. And then there's probably something at some company out there that's actually doing exactly what you want to do. That's fantastic advice. Well, Tanya, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Big thank you to our audience for tuning in and for all of your fantastic questions. We always love to hear from you. And uh, that, there was a lot of comments uh, in the chat as well. Tanya saying thank you for your presentation from our audience. So it's good to pass those along to you as well. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, terminate tonight's program. Unless, uh, Tanya, you have any final thought you want to share with us before we go? Um, no, just thanks everybody for tuning in. And I guess if you're on Twitter, you can find me as at Tanya of Mars. I think it's down here somewhere. I'm always happy to answer questions if anybody has any questions about Mars or space or working in the industry or students that have career questions, feel free to ping me anytime. Excellent. Well, Tanya, hopefully we'll see you around the Museum of Flight in person here sooner rather than later. Um, hope you stay safe and well over there in DC. And uh, with that, folks, we'll say good night. Uh, thank you again all for tuning in. And thank you again, Tanya, for being with us. Okay. Thanks, everyone.